Chuck. It's P. Simple. The revolution will be digitized. Real Talk Session Series. The revolution will be digitized. Talk session series, the revolution. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Taryn Morgan, the founder and creative director of the Real Talk Session Series. Now, for the past nine years, I have been working in higher education, and one of my professional passions is to making sure that students are advocated for at all times and fighting for their rights. And a few reasons why I created this platform was to provide a megaphone to the voiceless and also to expose the inequities that everyday people are facing. And today, I am proud to be at a very well-known private institution in North Jersey where students were going through different things and they took a stance instead of actually just taking it. And I've been following this group for a very, very long time and I'm extremely proud of them. I don't know them, but I see that they're doing the work that's needed. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Concern 44. How are you gentlemen doing today? Hello everybody. I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, my name is Marcellus Counts. I'm from Newark. Uh, graduated from University High School. Uh, right now, I'm studying social behavioral, social behavioral science, social work, and Africana studies, and that's just pretty much it. All right. Uh, I'm doing pretty well too. My name is Chris Duran. Um, I'm from Maplewood, New Jersey. I went, you know, Columbia High School. Uh, I'm studying history and Africana studies, and political science and Latino studies. And you know, I'm a senior here, and I'm one of the founding members of the Concern 44. I'm feeling good. My name is Zachary Clark. I'm from Jersey City. I graduated from Hudson Catholic High School. So, fellas, thank you so much again for inviting me. Um, I've been watching your movement since October, and salute to y'all definitely because a lot of students that I see within New Jersey, they don't take action when there's injustice being done to y'all. So, salute to y'all. So, how did y'all come up with the Concern 44? Well, like anything is... A process like mm. it's not something that just came up spontaneously it's took you know it's taken like a few years of us being at this university uh, taking you know African studies classes uh, being around for events in the community where we have been able to connect uh, the people who were in the movement back in the 1960s you know people who were in the Black Panther Party mm. and so we you know we were able to gain like a very close knowledge of you know where we're coming from and the sort of knowledge that is sort of a, you know, taken away from us because there is that gap between our parents' generation and that 1960s generation and us. And mm. so, you know, we just, I mean, we felt like we had a responsibility on this campus uh, to the people that came before us and to some of our mentors that we've had, you know, even on this campus. Higher education is a business. I know that because I work in it and also just in general when you look at the way it's set up. Oftentimes diversity, inclusion, customer service are words commonly thrown around, but oftentimes they're filled with empty promises and just generally buzzwords with no action associated behind them. So to my understanding, it was a lack of those areas. That's why this started. So can you go more into the story of how uh, the Concern 44 came to be at this institution? At this university, we had witnessed, you know, many accounts like among our peers of, you know, harassment, you know, based on racist premises from professors, from administration, from other students, mm -hmm. uh, you know, harassment, you know, sexual harassment on campus. And so we see these, you know, just basic problems in the way, you know, the safety of students, particularly black and brown students on this campus, mm -hmm. you know, and that, you know, that was just the main concern that we had to do something about that. And, you know, it's not, this is not a campus that we feel safe. This is not a campus where for those who are intellectually inclined to know about our history and how to develop, you know, where we come from, you know, it's not a place that we're able to access those resources. Mm. You know, we're able to take certain classes, but like it's very limited. Yeah. And we're paying for majors like Africana studies. We're paying for majors uh, like Latino studies, and we don't even see the curriculum reflected in that. And that goes to a you know, longer tradition of like even before we get to college, a lot of times we don't see that in the curriculum, you know, in mm -hmm. high school and middle school. Like I didn't learn nothing about, uh, you, know, you know, Latino history, or, you know, nothing real, you know, about what actually happened. You yeah. know, you just learn these certain stories that are all whitewashed and, you know, you know made safe for uh, words like diversity and inclusion and customer service to come about. But then you forget about the fact that why you know we're here is that it's because students 
and people who weren't standing up, people stood up for an idea of power, having power over their own lives, having power, having power over their own destiny. Mm. And so when we start off, we start off with this idea of like revolutionary love. Like we're trying to build something that we do not see yeah. uh, on this campus. We're trying to build something that claims power for us, not just merely inclusion into an institution mm. that isn't about us. During my professional career, I've had multiple conversations with students who complain about what's going on at institutions, but necessarily they don't take that next step to take action. They're more so social media activists where they'll complain online, but they won't actually put the footing down. And a lot of what you guys have done, you spoke about, uh, goes back to the civil rights era. Can y'all talk about the tactics that y'all use to create the much needed change? So as far as tactics, it's, it's funny that everybody recognizes like the spectacles of like the protest and like some of like the when we were posting like uh, the professor that we're trying to get out of here when we were posting his, his face and his names like that. People respond to that, but there was a lot of work that happened behind the scenes prior to that. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about meetings with the provost, president, different entities like this where we're trying to, you know, tackle these issues through the proper channels. You know, so there was a lot of those backdoor conversations where there's not, lack of transparency where there's lack of accountability. So mm -hmm. like, they're saying that this is gonna happen, this is gonna be changed, and they, they would like us to avoid um, taking it to, to the streets, to, to the people where the power really is, actually is at. So yeah. now when you talk about transcending those conversations and actually now we're trying to force their hand to, to step outside of their comfort zone, to really like actualize the racism and, and the underlying institutionalized racism that exists that really bogs us down. Mm -hmm they're kind of like you see that that's that's where they start to like kind of like 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 uh drag their feet you know what i'm saying yeah. and, and they're not like as uh poignant not as direct as like when uh we're, we're sitting in front of them talking back in the emails it's like this and that and giving us the runaround so that's what's transparent so i guess we should talk about the demands probably first so you would have like the meetings behind the door scenes meetings and then you have a list of demands that were proctored that went from 18 different demands that were about uh, Afghanist, Africana Studies program, which should be department, but mm -hmm. at this institution, it's program because of lack of like funding and lack of uh, resources. Uh, you have other things that are examined in uh, Title IX and EEO. So those offices, they control um, how issues of like diversity, racism, sexual assault, how those things are being uh, handled because we felt like the university wasn't doing their proper job of actually making sure those, those uh, things were taken care of properly. Um, yeah, so we have the document with the demands. But then as far as physical action, now we're talking about actually mobilizing people. They staged a number of different sit-ins where we occupied President's Hall. Uh, what about some of those, those other places? We protested in University Center. University Center. It, it was through campus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was all throughout campus, but the stronghold was at the President's Hall where the Office of EEO is, where the President, Provost, some of those, those big names were, were at. So that is really what caught the, the attention and really got things moving. And I really, I think it's like strength in numbers. So, I mean, the, like he said, it was years. It wasn't something that just came about and one day, like, everybody's on it. There has been dissension. There's been, like, negativity even within this very campus itself of people who don't support the protest because of personal things going on or because of, of you know, how, they, they, how, they's always, how they've always divided us for years, pitting us against each other, you know what I'm saying? You give one group uh, privileges or priorities, and then they take that, and now they, they're, like, dancing for master, basically, and turning their back on the rest of their brothers and sisters. So mm -hmm. you even have that stuff happening here in this institution in the small-scale politics. So as far as, like, like, working together and action, strength in numbers. Really organizing and gathering the people, having everybody on one front where we're all united and all like singing the same song, that, that's really the power of the people is, is getting the numbers and getting everybody really caring about each other. Because like you said, revolutionary love is really what gets this through. Yes. One thing that stood out about your organization from the beginning is that that organization, you guys are extremely organized. Um, I looked at all the documents you guys had, but the clearly defined demands and whatnot, and it was extremely impressive. So definitely, I'm going to keep applauding y'all because you're doing a great work. And I think that it was a great blueprint for a lot of students to use at other institutions who are facing the same issues. So um, my man over there, you know, what's going on, brother? Um, I'm going to ask you some questions because you've been a part of this movement kind of by association, but you don't attend the same institution, uh, but you did in the past. So you being at a public institution currently, what do you think is the difference of your experience from being at a private institution, which is where we're at right now, versus where you're at currently? I look at it like 
it's where the people are coming from. So the institution I go to now, being that it's public, it's a lot of people from the area. Mm -hmm. And you can tell because you look at the people and it's like, well, you, not to say that, you know, you can look at someone and tell where they're from, but it's, it's, it's one of those like six sense things where it's like, I, I can see that you're from the area. I can tell by the way you walk, by the way you talk, you're from the area. Yeah. Private institutions and the institution like the one we're sitting in right now, people get admitted from a lot of different places and they're not used to interacting with people who might look like me or Marcellus or even, or even Chris, sorry, Chris. So the, since they're not used to interacting with people like us or even that look like us, they just simply won't do it. Like for example, when I was attending this university, it was plenty of times where I'd have classes with folks and I'd have multiple classes with them. And if I'm walking around the campus, I'd look you dead in your face and it's no hello, no smile, no mm -hmm. nothing. We don't have to talk and, you know, sit sit there. We don't have to sit there and have a full-blown conversation. But the simple chuck a deuce yeah. or one of those, hey, what's up? Something like that. Where I go at now, the public, the public university, if I see somebody I know, black, white, Latino, whatever, if we even have, like, the smallest relationship where we sat next to each other for a few weeks. Yeah. Hey, what's up, man? I remember you. How you been? Blah, 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 blah. And that's the end of it. Yeah. But that same vibe and that same feeling doesn't carry here. Yeah. And I think it transcends just students. I think it also goes into professors when they're interacting with students, depending on who they are or what they look like. or And, and I don't even think that, like, to a point that it's on purpose. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's really subconscious. And that's the dangerous part about it. Yeah, that's like that implicit bias. Yeah. Cuz you can't you can't control that. You can't help that. You get what I'm saying? Mm. It's it's almost as if like your first instinct says to do something and now you have to step back and readjust instead of just your first instinct being what you would have adjusted to. You yeah. get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And really going back to what you said too, it touches the professors and whatnot. I work in higher education and it truly does. I've been on the academic side and I've been on the student affairs side and it's the same BS no matter where you go. Right. I worked at HBCUs, I worked at private institutions, I worked at public institutions, small, big, whatever. And I do notice those different differences like you spoke about with you'll see someone at a private institution and not from the area and they don't know how to address you or whatnot. Or in my case, I've been treated like a token sometimes. And that's not even at the institution I'm at currently, but that's at any uh, at another institution I was at before so it's really very different dynamics especially when you have schools preaching inclusivity diversity but their idea of that is quantity not actually including the idea of those persons the uh, the perspectives to create positive change that's needed definitely so you guys are the customers the students the students that pay about 50,000 a year what are some of the demands that have been met for you all from a result of your work that you've done so far? Well, in this initial stage, right after the protest, we see that our demands have not been met as we have set them by the university. Mm -hmm. The response that they gave to our, de uh, to our demands was basically, all right, let's throw some money at them and hope they go away. You know, let's Typical throw, response. Yeah. So, for example, the first demand was for an Afrikaans studies department with a full-time faculty adequate funding housed in its own space. This is not reinventing the wheel. This is something that was achieved back in 1970 mm -hmm. by, you know, when there weren't like a whole bunch of uh, so-called minority students. Uh, and I say so-called because in reality, you know, what are considered minority in the United States is the majority in the world. But, you know, this was something that they, you know, they looked at and they said, oh my God, we can't have this. Mm -hmm. And their response was, okay, we're going to give you a, a director to help build the program and advertise the program mm. uh, on a contract basis for 12 months. Mm. And, you know, th this was a, and the position when it was listed is, you know, if you, you can look it up, is pretty ridiculous, yeah. honestly. And that's why they didn't actually get that many uh, people applying to it, because it's not a job that people would want. Yeah. And we know how you build a department. You build a department by having tenured faculty. Mm. You build a department by having some sort of permanent commitment to actually having that study there yes. and actually taking that seriously. This administration has not taken that seriously whatsoever. 
our, their response to the demand for the same thing for Latino and Latin American studies was absolutely insulting. Mm. What they did was say, okay, we had this higher pre-approved for the English department to teach Latino uh, literature. They didn't consult with the Latino studies program in any type of way. They have multiple tenured faculty that can teach uh, Latino literature. Mm. But this was something that was already pre-approved before our protest uh, and something that wasn't consulted with students, with faculty or whatsoever by the English department to make themselves look diverse, to make themselves look inclusive, to make yeah. them, to ba again, basically promote this idea of diversity and inclusion from their bastion of, you know, white comfort of white supremacy, mm. <laughs> you know, white control over, you know, the curriculum. And, you know, and, and you know, that's not, you know, it's, it's saying that because in reality, all these institutions have been about white control over the, you know, curriculum for hundreds of years. Mm. You know, that's where academia is founded on. So they don't, you know, they don't take that idea of diversity and inclusion seriously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when it came to funding, they gave, uh, you know, they basically gave like, some, was it 20000 Yeah. It was originally, you can talk about it. So going into just more of a, like the university's response as far as uh, complying with the demands. Now, he talked about them throwing money at us. So what they did, even even touching on some of those buzzwords you were talking about. So we're, we're raising questions about racism, white supremacy, things like that. They deliver us a diversity and inclusion grant where they involve the student government at the university. So now you have all these other entities coming in that have been failing us prior to mm -hmm. the protests, things like that, kind of frontiering the process on diversity and inclusion, even though they are the same system that's been failing prior to, like he said, they just throw money at us, $20,000 that has you have, I think, somewhere around 83 different organizations mm -hmm. fighting for th th this grant money. And the way that I was on the part of the committee, the way that it kind of just ended up being was that there was nothing a part of it that really made okay. um, organizations really push the curb to be innovative and be creative when they were trying to tackle these questions of diversity and inclusion. People started to just look at it as a funding source and started using it to actually fund programs that they were already putting on prior to the grant even being created. Mm. So you see, like, 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 like of course, even in higher government where you see, you know, oh, we're going to give $3 million to Newark. We're going to give $5 million to Jersey City. And then where, what happens to that money? You, you don't see any impact. You don't see any direct correlation between the issues and the solutions. Mm -hmm. So you, you can do. I would, I also would like to add on to that the response to the last two demands. Uh, the, one of the demands uh, was to the issue of the Office of EO and Title IX. Um, to, you know, the accountability you know that we have not seen on mm -hmm. this campus for you know years and that we have known has been going on you know years prior to you know we even got here mm -hmm. so they made it you know they made a promise to reconfigure the office however or to review the office however we know that they have not taken this seriously because there was a professor that during the protest assaulted a student mm. He's still and walking around here. He's still employed? Mm-hmm. Oh, And wow. they actually had, uh, he came out with a few blog posts where he went on, like, these very, like, racist, homophobic, you know, tirades. Mm. And the university knows he did it. And faculty in the School of Arts and Sciences had known that he did it for months. Mm. And nothing was done about it. And now they say they put him on administrative leave. However, we found out that they lied about this because he's still grading papers. He's still the instructor of the course. Mm. And because he's tenured, they don't want to do anything uh, about it. They don't really want to hold him accountable. So, again, that issue of accountability, we've seen them brush that aside as well. Yeah. And then there's the issue of uh, student um, review of the hiring process. We wanted there to be a permanent student board uh, to review the hiring process for prospective professors, particularly black and Latino professors. Which because is a of the reasonable fact combination. Like, it's reasonable. <laughs> yeah. You know, those who have a stake in the program, those who have a stake in seeing their lives reflected in the people who are teaching them, mm. who are going to be their mentors, you know, who are going to help them with their careers. Yeah. You know, they should have, con you know, control or at least a say in that process. And with this director position, the entirety of the committee that has a vote in hiring the new African Studies director is all white, 
And that, and that's not, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, it's not, you know, you can't have white people. In. Well, it's the entire committee is white. Yeah. And you the entire committee the has needs. no, yeah, the entire committee has no experience in Africana studies whatsoever. Mm. Like as a dis as an academic discipline. So on principle, they have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. And they have uh, three students opinions uh, on that committee. Mm. And even one professor who was who is one of the few black professors on this campus. Uh, who has been here for 40 years uh, doesn't have a vote on that committee. Mm. So, again, you know, we don't see a serious response to our demands. Yeah, and that's definitely sad. Um, if you could say one thing, because we're getting to wrap up, one thing each to executive leadership, what would it be? To executive leadership at this institution, we see it as a microcosm of this country as a whole. Mm. This country as a whole for five, you know, for going back before this government's founding has never cared about black or brown people. Mm. And any time that they have promoted themselves as being, you know, oh, having a mission of diversity and inclusion, it's always been on the basis of still controlling the, the, those people, you know, our lives. Yeah. So, honestly, the main message that I have is really let our you know let us have control of our own lives mm. you know honestly let us have power over our own lives because you know you can't do it for us yeah what about any other you gentlemen which one of these is the audience oh he about to get into it right there, right there. <laughs> all right to the executive leadership leadership of the country Stop playing with people's lives. Just because you don't care about everybody else or whoever's at the bottom or you can't see them doesn't mean that they don't exist. Stop robbing people of their money and putting it in your own pockets and buying yachts and land and whatever else and just trying to build a monopoly on stuff and spread the sugar. There's people out here dying. There's people out here starving. It's been a few years removed, but I'm pretty sure Flint water looked like me. Mm -hmm. Dig, stop playing with people's lives. Because if we flip the script and we put you in the middle of the hood and decide that we're not going to care about you, you're going to want to uproar too. And y'all and, and going to act like like y'all was being done so wrong. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Put, your, put yourself in somebody else's shoes and try to walk up the block. That's really it. I appreciate that powerful word, bro. And definitely, he put you in the back seat. He like last one. Nah, I mean, <laughs> so not, I, not even. I mean, it, that, that's all. That's all energy, and that's that's all fuel, fuel and fire. These are definitely two people I'm close to. So I mean, hearing their words, you know what I'm saying, definitely emboldens me and like like lets me know that that it, we got to keep keep fighting. But mm -hmm. I think if I could say anything to executive leadership, it would be that we got to stop thinking that like like it's it's a power struggle where it's like we trying to take somebody's power away. Historically. They've been exploiting us forever. Yes. So we can tell what's good for us is good for everybody. So we need collectively some of these bigger, higher ups to start investing in black people and not in that backhanded way where it's like, here, 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 just, just to be quiet. Actually, like, like, like dedicating commitment, like he said, concern, like, like, like real care, you know what I'm saying? Almost mm -hmm. like, like to build that community, to build some of these pieces that are missing. But not only that, but also like, I think about how I'm in Newark and I walk through the streets, you know what I'm saying? I go into a store and everybody in that store working between the door and the people making the pizza or making that is black. Yeah. But then you see all the executives, you see all the administration, you see all the, like, the corporate actual faces white, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I feel like at what point, you know what I'm saying, are, are everyone saying, oh, racism exists or oh, we're, we're not doing anything when you're inhabiting these spaces that really don't belong to you, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Because we're, we're competent, you know what I'm saying? You see all these professors, you see all these people working hard, doing all these different things, and it's like, like, at what point are you going to step down and allow somebody else to have an opportunity to do something? You know what I'm saying? You got people yeah. sitting on seats for years, you know what I'm saying? So really just, just help us help you, you know what I'm saying? Invest in us, and we will, like we always have, take care of everybody. Okay. Well, I appreciate You got something to say? As people, we need to start supporting each other. Black needs to support black and brown needs to also support brown. I don't see enough of that. Black and brown need to support each other too. Yeah. Yep. Let me add and, on and, to that. And, 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 and cross. We all in this together. We all, we, we need to, but what I'm saying, what I, why I said it like that was because I see a lot of self-hatred reflected on your brother. Mm. You don't like something about you 
you not cool with your situation. So when you see somebody walking down the block who looks like you, yeah. walks like you, talks like you, you decide to take your anger out on that person because you subconsciously hate that person. Because mm -hmm. when you see that person, you see you. We need to stop doing that. We need to come together. When we see other people, we need to stop coming in jealousy and we need to come in, in, in happiness or... I can't even think of the term right now, but when I see you shining, I'm supposed to be happy you shining. I'm yeah. not supposed to be trying to steal your shine. Or yeah. even or even trying to take away from your shine. You get what I'm saying? I want shine too, but I shouldn't be jealous because you you blinging. You feel me? I should be happy for you and I should be looking to get to that myself. But I should also take my money to where it circulates to where I'll see it again. One of the worst things that happened to the black community was desegregation. Mm. And I know that's, that sounds pretty crazy, but it's true. Because before desegregation, black people was forced to spend their money at black enterprises. Yeah. Black mom and pop shops was doing good. But mm -hmm. the second black people was able to go shop at Macy's, they took their money to Macy's. And the yeah. black enterprise suffered. We need to go back to the black enterprise, build black Wall Street back up. Yeah. And let's have something because when I look around in the black community, we don't really have much. It's like when Marcella said, you look in a pizzeria, you look in these places, yeah, black people working there, but mm -hmm. who cutting a check? Exactly. And a lot of that goes back to history too. People don't want to read. There is power within the words. And especially if you go back, everything we're experiencing today, Carter G. Woodson wrote about that in the education of the Negro back in the early 1900s. Same exact stuff going on. So I highly suggest that you all read it and especially you all out there because it'll open your eyes to what's been going on in the programming conditioning that has caused us to be stagnant in society. So gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Well, actually no, thank you so much for housing me because you know this is something big and I wanted to get your story out because I've been following for a while and y'all are doing amazing, outstanding work. Can you let the people know how they can support you all and also how they get in contact with you? I mean, you can follow us on Instagram and on every social media platform at shoe underscore concern 44. That's S-H-U con underscore concern 44. Uh, please, you know, just repost, you know, our content, help get you know, our message out there and support us by also, you know, organizing in your own communities, organizing in your own campuses, your own high schools, your own middle schools, wherever you are, you know, we're fighting a struggle that is not you know, we see as a part of a larger, you know, movement. You know, what we do here is for the, you know, is for, is bigger than us. It's bigger than our degrees, it's bigger than our careers. It's something that is, you know, essential to our survival, you know, as a whole. You know, all power to the people is not a slogan. You know, it's a practice. So everybody, wherever you are, claim power over yourself, empower the, your brothers and sisters next to you, and let's get this done. <laughs> Woo, he about to yeah. get me out here starting a rally out here. All right. yeah, word up. Yo, that, that, that's energy right there. I mean, I, I ain't even going to drop no handles like that. If you see me out in the streets of Newark, you already know what's up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you can pull up. We out here. You know what I'm saying? Beautiful city. Beautiful people. Like he said, it's all about sharing the love. So I, 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 that's my piece. You know what I'm saying? I ain't tripping off the Instagram likes. I don't care about none of that. I care about change. <laughs> yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. So y'all want to get in touch with me? Make sure when I come to your city, wherever your city is at, I see a difference. That's it. All right. When I go somewhere, I want to see a difference. I want to see y'all out there making an impact. Mm -hmm. like Screw Instagram. I right? Y'all out here loving this social media, but it don't love you back. True. Because the second you do something dumb, they going to chew you up like they did everybody else. Go out there and do something. Do something that matters. Put your fingers down. Cut them off. Do it. I don't, I don't know what you got to do, all right? But make a difference. <laughs> all right, fellas. Thank you so much. These are our future leaders of America, and they're doing a great job. So please support them in any way you can. And please follow their platform so you can stay informed and in what is going on. Because I think that what they're doing is extremely revolutionary in our times and college students y'all this is proof that you have a voice and you can make change so thank you for tuning in to another episode of the real talk session real talk session series the revolution will be digitized real talk session series the revolution will be digitized oh, yeah. real talk session series the revolution will be digitized Talk session. It's too simple. The revolution will be digitized.